morning. Can you hear me loud and clear? All right, good. I hope everyone's doing well. It's an honor to share with you this morning. Uh, before we get started, uh, one of my pet peeves, whether I'm sitting in youth or in the sanctuary, let's grab our cell phones, let's put those on silent or turn them off if needed. I know when I sit there in my seat, I thank my parents for the discipline they installed in me growing up, but also the military did a really great job of just like feeding this into me. When I sit there and hear cell phones going off, I cringe so bad as if I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm not the one at fault. And so uh, let's just be respectful to that. Take a look at your cell phone, put that on silent, and respect those around us as well. Um, very great series we've been going over of Word Up. And if you haven't been here for that, we're, we're talking about words, words of encouragement, um, building each other up through the Word of God, but also as we look at words and um, God's Word, but just in general as we talk, think about our words, what we do to, to hurt one another. Um, as I was doing some research on just the way we interact with people, with our friends, our family, our spouse, um, just in general in the workplace, I, w- I kept looking up, why do we hurt the people who are the closest to us? Like, why do we hurt their feelings? Why, do we, why are we mad at them? Um, if you're married, I don't know why, but if your spouse wakes up, my wife wakes up, and she's mad, I, she's going to be mad at me. I don't know why, but um, I'll, do, I'll apologize for, I don't know what I did or what I might do, but I'll apologize, so hopefully uh, we get through the day. But um, I'm somewhat kidding about that. But uh, as we look at, as we interact through, through life, we end up hurting or being mean to the ones who are closest to us and who we love. I don't know why that is, but as I research this, this is what um, every definition and every study was given to me. It says, we hurt the ones that we love due to fear of rejection and disconnection. Um, we, treat the, we treat someone with uh, such hurt um, because... We want that connection with one another. But when you think about it, the way we treat someone with, with hurtful words and, and being mean to them and, and making them feel down and out, we continue to push for disconnection. But it's weird how every study keeps saying we treat them this way because we're afraid of this. We're in fear of it. And uh, as I go through each one of these points, I'm going to go through um, a, a lot of content of uh, scripture. Um, a scripture that I've heard many times, maybe if you've been in church for a while, in Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 27, and it's talking about a town called Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I've been in church for 36 years since I was born. I had no choice. My parents brought me here. I've been born and raised here, and then uh, I had to make a choice on my own to, uh, if I wanted to follow this and, and have my own relationship with Christ, or, or do what I want to do, just like any of us making those choices. And hearing this scripture, I've always heard this scripture paraphrased. I've, I've read it on my own. Um, I've heard other pastors speak on behalf of it, but I've always heard uh, this scripture just paraphrased and broken down. Now, I'm going to go through the content of it. Just bear with me. Um, we're going to go through uh, 27 verses of this, just so that way you have strong content of what's taking place in this town. And as I go through this, think of the words. We're talking about uh, words of encouragement, words that could be discouraging to us and how we could build one another up. But our main thing that we're talking about in here is obedience. As I read the scripture, obedience kept uh, popping up to me in here. And as we go through this, uh, listen to the words. It is graphic. Um, You'll see here shortly, it's just filled with a lot of perversion in this town. And when you think about it, we keep saying, like, oh, that's history. That's so far long ago. But look at what's taking place in our world, in our, our world now. Look what's probably taking place, um, I, don't, I mean, hopefully not in this town, but just in, in general. It's, um, we covered this a few months ago, but what's wrong is now right, and what's right now becomes wrong. And Pastor Eric hit on that, and this was already established for us uh, so many years back. So... The word obedience, okay, just a basic Google search from this. So it's compliance with an order, request, or law, a submission to another authority or to someone's authority. Now, as we go through this on um, Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, 
I'll be reading out of the NIV. Follow along with me, please. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot, this is the individual who was there in the town, was sitting at the gateway of the city. When he saw them, saw the angels, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. The angels answered, no, we will spend the night here in the square, meaning they're in the hometown with him. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. All right, he was trying to secure them as quick as possible. He prepared a meal for them, breaking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us. Here we go, okay? Listen to this. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that way we can have sex with them. Now, as we hear that, we're like, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so this town, Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, think about it as our present Las Vegas. Okay? Now, I'm also like, crap, I've been there. Uh, yeah, so have I. We compete, we do jiu-jitsu over there. Okay? But just think of everything. I know it's probably hard to, or we sit here in shame, even probably trying to think about this, but just think of the, the perversion of, of the world, the perversion of what's going crazy. And I say Vegas because when you go over there, you know it, it's just a, a party central that, that's legal, and you just make it happen. And so that's what's going on here, but as you can see in the context of the scripture, it is way worse of what's uh, taking place. So as we continue, Lot went outside to meet them, and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters. Pay attention here. I have two daughters who never, who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you'd like to them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Hold on. I have two daughters. Okay? And as I was reading this, I kept thinking, um, my girls are young. I have a two-year-old, and I have a six-month-old. For those of you who are out there, as I think of, uh, of our youth and the young girls who sit in our youth, I can't imagine as a father and a protector and, and a mentor to even, that would even go through my head. But that's going through his head like, wait, 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 don't harm these angels. But here, you can have my daughters, these virgins, you can take them, you can do whatever you want with them. Um, you know, I have a, a, I'm pretty sure when it comes to our family, fathers, grandparents, um, mothers, uh, she don't mess with the mother and, and their kids, but my mind was drifting away when I was reading this, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie by Mel Gibson, The Patriot, and uh, there's some pretty graphic scenes in there, but this is what was going through my head, and a pastor had said this way before I did, a few years back, and I was just like, I get you when you're saying this, that's how I, I'm probably going to feel that way when I have kids, but I was reading this, uh, that movie Patriot, you see Mel Gibson when um, it's during the time of the Revolutionary War and um, the United Kingdom soldiers come through and they just wreak havoc through the town and they go into his house and one of the captains there, they, they kill his son and they have his daughters, they say they're going to take his daughters and Mel Gibson, he, he just flips. They kill his son and he grabs his boys and he goes, let's go, it's only three of us and 20 of them. And he takes off, and he just does what I think any parent would do if their kids were probably taken in that wartime manner. So when this pastor's talking about it, I'm reading that movie, and I'm, I mean, I'm watching that movie, and I read this scripture, Mel Gibson has, he comes down to a knife and a hatchet, and he just goes to work on there. I'm not going to get into too much of it. You can just watch it for yourself. But the anger that he just has... Of, of what took place with this kid, the hate that built up, of, of what was going on. This is, I'm reading this, and I'm like, man, my two daughters, man, I'm going to grab me my knife and my hatchet, and, and I feel the exact same way. So let me get back on track here with this, but that was going through my head as, as I was reading this. In verse 9, get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved him forward to break down the door. But then the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door, the angels. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, 
so that they could not find the door. And two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, your son-in-law or daughters or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So these people are praying, Lord, please help us. This town is horrible, it's perverted. We need help here, and there's more evil than there is good, and there's nothing we can do here. Evil has overtaken this place, so the angels have been sent to destroy that whole town. So they're giving, you see right here, God's grace is given to Lot and his family, and he's telling Lot, who do you have that you want to take with you to go somewhere else because we're about to wipe this place clean? So we're moving forward now. Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that it has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. And he said, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his son, his son-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you'll be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of the two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. Okay, pay attention to that part. If you're taking notes, please write that down. Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please, your servant has found favor in your eyes and you. You have shown us great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, very well, I'll grant, I'll grant you this request. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. And this is a small town they were going to called Zoar. So just think about this. Angels came down. They said, we're about to destroy Kern County. You need to go somewhere. They're like, I'm going to go to Delano. So very well. We're going to wipe out Kern County. Go to Delano as fast as possible. Do not look back. That is the command that I'm giving you. Do not look back at all. But f flee there quickly on verse 22, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land and the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, destroying the town. From the Lord out of heavens, thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation of the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And we're ending there on 26. I'll read that from verse 25 to 26. Thus he overthrew the cities in the entire plain, destroying all those living in the city, destroyed the town, everyone living in it, and also the vegetation of the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. So the reason why I pulled obedience off of this is because we talk about words of encouragement. We're talking about building each other up. You can see this town is so evil, and the angels show up, show them grace, and then he even gives Lot the option to choose whoever you want to get out of here. This is a very evil place, very simple place. You have the option. I'm just letting you choose whoever you want to get out of here, giving them grace as well. But just don't look back. That's the only command. Keep running. Don't look back. And it doesn't even say why, but Lot's wife, for whatever reason, is running. She turns and looks back and instantly dies, turns into a pillar of salt. So when I look at this, we cannot control dark matters on our own in the natural. That's why we need Jesus and we need guidance from everything that we do. Um, I just see Lot's wife, it doesn't even say her name, but I just see her missing like her old sinful life. I don't know why. Like it could have been her, it could have been someone else, but the scripture says it was her. Like when we come to that revelation in our life when we want to follow Christ. Um, I had that struggle as well, too, where it's like, yes, I want to do, I want to come to church, I want to, I want to serve, but my life outside of this is a lot more greater, but my life outside of this continues to pull me in the direction that I don't want to be in. It's the exact same thing that we're getting here. We're talking about obedience, the exact same thing here. 
And as I see more and more people who, who get involved in the church or want to be part of, of serving in the church and follow Christ, um, there's two things that take place. One, we get involved in the church and we kind of nest, don't know really where we want to go or how to do this, but then we're also too shy to engage with people. And then two, we have people who've been part of the church or been part of Christianity for a while, but yet um, they don't have the courage to go and speak to other people and help build them up, or we're just lazy within our own, our own self-righteousness and we lack the engagement. Um, some subnotes you could take on this as well. Um, stop looking back at your past and your sin, and more importantly, as a person, quit reminding people of their past and their sin. I mean, that's like one of the one of the things that I've had to deal with. I know many of you had to deal with as well as you sit here in the church and you start going to church. And the sad thing is about it is it's family members and those closest to you. Remember the content I covered in the beginning of this. Why do we why do we hurt the people closest to us? We get reminded of remember what you did to me ten years ago. Remember what happened. Remember this. And I'm like, I thought we were past that. As we continue to move forward, let's celebrate small victories and progress. I think we look at when we come to know Christ and, and follow God and, and follow Jesus that we just, it is great. Don't get me wrong. But we look, that, we look to this and we think that everything's just going to change right away. And, and it doesn't. It uh, sounds funny, but it's, it's a turtle race. It's, uh, it, it takes a while. It takes perseverance. It takes a lot of discipline. And we're looking for a lot of instant gratification and, and instant answers and prayers answered like this. But think about it. What, what are we doing to benefit the gospel and get the gospel out there? Not what is God going to do for you, but what can you do for God? What can you do to glorify his kingdom? What can we do to get his gospel out there? That's how we need to look at, at scripture and, and ministry and, and just getting the gospel out there in, in general. And point number two, I'm sorry, that was point number one, power and obedience. I just said that before I covered the scripture. Power and obedience. And as we go to point number two, prayer at work. My uh, parents growing, as I grew up, they were... I mean, they still are. They, they pray all the time. And sometimes I used to get embarrassed uh, growing up because my, my dad or my mom, they would pray for us in the car as they're dropping us off. And I, as I started getting older, I didn't like them to, like, kiss me on the head anymore or hug me. And I'm just like, gosh, like, it's embarrassing. A popular girl over there who likes me is staring. My friends are over there. Like, please, don't embarrass me like that. And my mom... He's like, Ryan, get over here. Give me a kiss before you go to school. I'm like, why are you making a mean face at me like that? As I'm, but you love me, but you have this mean face to kiss me goodbye. But um, they used to, all, they always prayed for us. They still do till this day. My, uh, as I look at my kids, my daughter, before we eat, she always grabs my hand. And she says, Daddy, pray. I'm like, yep, we'll pray for our food. My, um, my parents, they they pray with my kids. Um, whenever we FaceTime uh, my mom, Emery always looks at her shoulder because she had uh, surgery and she has a scar. And she says, she says, Nana, pray. And she sticks her hand out. She touches the phone where it's at to, like, to pray for her. My son, I can call him up here right now and be like, hey, can you pray for everyone uh, as we go through the rest of the week? He'll get up here. No shame. Pray easily. And, and get up here. Well, we're talking about words, so you look at the encouragement of our kids from, from parents to grandparents. Um, but prayer at work. Um, David's prayer in the Psalms, um, I've covered this a few times, but you look at David's prayer in the Psalms, and he's so up and down in, in the book of Psalms. Such a great warrior, fighting, slaying the giant, Known as the warrior, but then now he's known as the adulterer. And he is so, um, 
he's torn from this. And he is literally crying out in the Psalms for God's mercy. And when I, every morning when I wake up, I, always, my, I start my day off always with praying. I never thought I would. I used to see my dad do it every morning. He grinds, wake up, Bible out, praying. And I used to just see him every morning. I'm like, man, he's up early every morning about praying, reading every single time. I'm going to try to do that. And it worked out so well for me. In a different generation. But I find myself every morning, as soon as, it's every time when I'm washing up, as soon as I get in the shower, I always pray, Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning. Uh, I start praying for my wife and my kids, taking on the day. I don't know what we're about to get, my, get into. You know, I know the plans as far as work and, and what I have set for the day, but as far as what's going to come forth, I don't know. So I just ask for uh, grace, peace, guidance, patience, and uh, that's how I get my day going. And in Psalms 51, verse 1, as we turn there, Psalms 51, verse 1 through 2, and this is David's prayer. Um, If you do not know what to say when you are praying, highlight this right here. This will be good for you to to start off with with praying and, and saying this every morning as you start your day. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot out all my transgressions, wash away all my inequity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now, as I go through these points and and covering prayer, um, sometimes just on our own, our mind takes the best of us, and we remind our own selves of our own sin, and we remind ourselves of of our past. And this this is what we need to do to block that out. Um, for myself, I, I shared this a few years ago, and Pastor Eric had me come up here and speak during uh, one of our series where we used to have the, the sit-downs up here on the couches, and it was uh, uh, continuing to follow Christ and serve during a time of darkness. And uh, you guys know I, I served in the military, um, went to Iraq twice, Afghanistan twice, and over the time, developed um, what's called sleep paralysis. I know a few others struggle with that as well. As I learn more about it and study it, sleep paralysis, there is no, um, there's no cure for it. And if you don't know what that is, you fall asleep at night, you have a nightmare, uh, you become paralyzed when you're asleep. And you actually wake up where your body's still asleep, but everything's still playing in your head. And you can... It's like you wake up and it's almost like an out-of-body experience where you can see what's taking place. I know Pastor Eric deals with the same thing as well. They're developed over time with traumatic events. If you experience anything um, traumatic, you probably experience this. But I started to experience this in 2007. And then over time, it got worse, it got worse, it got worse. And then it really took over me from like 2010 to about... 2017, 18, and it pretty much should happen almost every every night to the point where I was like a little kid, like afraid of the dark, where I didn't want to fall asleep because I knew what was going to come at night. And so um, there's no, well, the doctors try to add medication. They were giving me some stuff to uh, lower my blood pressure, to lower my blood pressure so that way I wouldn't dream at night. Think about it, you're getting medicated so you don't dream at night. That's actually bad because that means it damages your REM sleep, uh, which you need for your full rest in order to uh, to get your rest, to recover. So I'm getting self-medicated for that um, just so that way I can find rest, but I'm not. I'm being medicated for it. On top of that, I was getting other um, medication, antidepressants, to try to uh, sedate myself and keep me, to keep that REM sleep, to keep keep me sedated while I sleep. And every time I would take that, I would always, I would wake up and I'd be, I wouldn't be myself. I'd be like a, a zombie. Um, couldn't function at all. So I was like, okay, now I'm in a battle. I don't want to take anything because now I know I'm not going to be myself. That's not me 
getting my proper rest, and then when I wake up, I'm not going to be myself. But yet, I need to find something because I'm afraid to fall asleep, but I'm fighting against myself to fall asleep because I know what's going to happen. Um, over time, I just begin to talk about it more, and I threw away everything. I stopped taking the, that medication, and I'm not. This is not a a message for you to grab your medication and throw it away. Please take it if you really need it, and let's use wisdom with this. But for myself, I had to uh, I had to get more focused and, and dialed in and um, become transparent with my family and, and my friends who were wanting to be involved in my life. So what helped sustain this, it didn't go away. It's still there. It happens maybe once, twice a month, but there's a whole lot of sustainment now and a, a lot better um, reaction to um, sleep paralysis. As I began to talk about it more, as I began to meditate more, pray more, uh, talk about it with my wife, my friends, and family, um, usually when it happens, I, I, I just wake up and then I just go right back to bed. Like, okay, it's a bad dream, I just go right back to bed. Uh, what used to happen almost every night, a couple times a week, has now turned into maybe like two or three times a month. Now, did I want this instantly gone? Of course I did. I think any of us dealing with anything tragic, you want that gone as soon as possible. But it takes time. Like I'm saying, like the Word of God says, and like what, I, what I'm telling you, we want everything so instant, but we have to put in some work. So I had, to, I had to put in some work of prayer. I had to put in some work of, of focusing, reading, and then more importantly, my engagement with people. You know, God doesn't have us go through life alone. We go through life together. As we uh, move forward, um, a few subpoints here. Patience in our waiting. What are we doing during that? Um, some things I, I see and from my friends and just other people, but... Um, in our, in our waiting seasons or even during our, our, our times as we're, we're praying and believing and stuff, you'll see where it's, it's talked about or it's boasted about or even posted about. Sometimes nobody needs to know your business, what you're going through, but we're posting about it on social media. So what, what do we get out of that? Okay, one, you'll get your gratification of your likes. Okay, you might get a few comments from a few nice people of like encouraging you or want to know... Uh, more of what's going on in your life, like, hey, what's going on? What happened? Okay, and then here's the worst part of that. By posting all this stuff and putting your problems out there, especially if you put it in your story, now instead of likes and comments and maybe a few DMs, direct messages from that, depending on how many followers you have, and now you have over 400 people who have viewed your issues, but yet you have no connection with anybody. Now you've got strangers and People you probably don't even talk to. People who are not really your friend, they just hit follow and just to see what you got going on in your life. Yeah. Um, this is just something that just popped up to me as, as I was reading through this because I see that with, um, not only with, with my generation, um, but the, a lot with the younger generation as well. Something happens and then we're posting about it. And then what happens? People gratify to that. One, you get some encouragement. Two, you get some like, well, what happened? What'd you do about it? We want to know, instead of helping the issue, we're just feeding to that issue. So in your patience, ask yourself, what am I doing about it? What am I doing to make it a lot better? Venting is okay, but don't vent to the wrong person. I always tell my wife, I'm going to, like, whatever my day goes, I'll vent about it, and then it'll be done. No more. Um, I have a saying in my house, don't become the captain complainer. Hey, don't, don't be that. You can vent about it. Let's get over it and then do something about it. Well, what changes can we make? Um, serving in your waiting. I, I believe that's what really helped me as I, as I went through um, a few of the dark times in my life. Playing an instrument, helping out with the youth, being engaged with, with people. Um, during my serving, that's what helped me engage more with the issues that I had. Remember, we don't want to be reminded of our sin, whether it be from people or in our own minds. So you got to ask yourself, how, what can I do to get over this? What can I do to move forward from this? And serving in your waiting, working through it, helping others, 
if you notice, the more and more you continue to concentrate and, and pray and, and read and engage with one another, you'll see a combination of your patience and serving. You'll begin to see a healing process take place in your life. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Now, in this scripture, um, in the gospel, they're talking about uh, when you're helping people or when you're giving to the poor or the homeless. But when you think about this, we're, this applies to us in general, helping anybody, conversations, anything. Okay? As I go through the context, just follow along. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. They say don't boast about it in the churches and be like, hey, look at me. Or on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Plain and simple, okay? He's not telling you be be ashamed of the gospel. No, just share the gospel. But we don't need to be holding our phone up as we're trying to help somebody taking a selfie, or, hey, look at me, look what I'm doing. Let's keep that to ourselves. Keep those conversations private to one another. You don't need any type of recognition, but besides internally, um, with, the, with who you serve and for those who you're involved with. Well, that's, what, that's what God's instruction is right here in the Gospels. Um, just a... a a real-life story of, of prayer in action and confirmation. I think when we look at prayer, you know, we pray for the essential things, good job, family, things we're believing for, and for those things to come in the past. Um, one of them that has always stuck with me is, uh, like I said, my family is a, is a praying family. Uh, my, uh, my dad told me, uh, I think I was in Afghanistan. Yeah, I was in Afghanistan, my last appointment. And uh, he had a dream that uh, I had gotten wounded. I'd gotten shot and gotten wounded, and they called him as during his whole dream. And so he immediately woke up, and he got on his hands and knees and started praying, hoping that wasn't going to happen. Because when you're over there, you can't, I can't call home when I feel like it. It's just whenever there's free time. If they could get a satellite phone to us, you, there's no contact over there at all. And so um, the, this bad dream that he had, he just, the first thing he did was just got up and started praying and for guidance, healing, that not to be true. And then uh, shortly after, I call him while he's praying. I call him, and I'm like, hey, Dad, how's it going? Oh, good, yeah, son, good to hear from you. So I'm talking to him. You can't talk long. You only got about a five- to ten-minute window before you have to hand the phone off to somebody else. Um, so I was just talking to him, but he was telling me the story that took place because what was frightening and fearful and what I know we don't want those type of phone calls um, from any family member or friend. Um, he's praying, and then I here I come, I call, and then I give him that confirmation. Well, God gives him confirmation of everything's okay. So what happens? Goes right back to bed, perfectly fine. Okay, we see that when uh, with the storm, when Jesus is with his disciples, there's a storm, and there's so much chaos, and what happens? Everyone, calm down. Storm, relax. The storm relaxes, and what happens? Jesus stays in sleep the whole time. Well, there's peace. There's peace in prayer. There's when prayer is at work, and that's that's what we're talking about in point number two. In point number three, be authentic. Be authentic. Authentic, I, had a, I looked this up just because I like giving uh, more clarity behind the words and points that are given. But authentic, just should regular Google search. True to your own personality, values, and spirit, regardless of the pressure that you're under to act otherwise. Now, 
to be authentic, the only thing I can speak upon is my generation, 40 and under. I'm closer to 40 than I am 30, so you could try to guess my age. But um, the 40 and under crew, um, I see as they go to follow Christ and, and say they want to be um, disciples and, and have that relationship with, with God is it's more of a, um, I don't know how to say it, just besides the way that I wrote it, but it's more of a, a fill in the blank. Like, yeah, I'm Christian. Like, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. And that's it. Not a, a relationship or understanding of, of the character and his being of who he is and then applying it to ourselves and then applying it to others. It's just more of a, um, let me just follow, let me just go to church, let me just do this routine, and that's about it. There's very little works, there's very little engagement of conversation, and it's just a uh, lack of, of biblical understanding and engagement with one another. And what I mean by that is we see something that looks good, like buying a pair of shoes. But then after wearing that pair of shoes, after you've cleaned them off a few times, they get old after a while, so you have to buy a new pair, right? And I, I just see, I'm talking about my generation. Like I said, 40 and under. If you're over that, someone else can, can get on that generation. This applies to all. The gospel applies to all. Okay? So we look for always the new. We want that instant. You want that microwave gospel. Let me put it in there for 30 seconds. Everything's good. It's nice and hot and ready. I'm ready to eat. But instead of, of sitting there and, and prepping everything, prepping your life, prepping your heart, and engaging with one another and, and working on ourselves, we want that instant gospel as soon as possible. And it doesn't work that way. And that's what I see with my generation is less of authentic and more of self-righteousness. Um, and the reason why I hit on this is because that was me for the longest time. And um, as we cover a lack of biblical understanding. I know in this church, you will not get my opinion. This is not my opinion as I go through this. This is um, Bible verses backing my experience, um, not my experience in, as far as the Scripture, because Scripture was written way before us, but this is all set forth before us, meaning whatever we are going through or feeling, it has already been done. That's why he said it is finished. Like, it's done. Now it's up to us to let go of our selfishness and apply it and do something about it. Like, what are you going to do about it? Like, why would you want to sit there, not do nothing, and have nightmares all night and have sleep paralysis and then complain about it? I have so much nightmares, but I don't pray at night and I don't talk about it with one another. Okay, we, we sit here like, I, I can't get this job. Oh, I'm praying for this, I'm praying for that. I can't do that. But then we don't pray about anything. You're not applying for the job. You just want someone to give it to you. You see what I'm saying? But that's what I'm saying. Remember, I'm talking about my generation. Okay, so everyone else, Mr. Lucas or BC or Pastor Eric or P Pastor Kathy can hit on that. 40 and under. You're 40 and under? Right here. Okay, I got you. We need to, all of us as a church, need to... Um, continue to build our, our backbone on the gospel. And if you look at, as we go through points, and you show up here in church, and you ask yourself, I don't know where to even start. Like, I, I, I came, um, I heard about this church, you guys play good music, I like, my kids like coming here, um, I just like the environment, awesome. Now, we have to put in some sort of work to ourselves to establish that relationship. You can't rely on whoever's speaking or the pastor and, pastors and elders to just continue to, to build, you, build you up. They are. Don't get me wrong. They will, but you have to do something on your own to continue that. Um, if you're taking notes, you can just start off by reading the Gospels. If you don't know what that is, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? That is the birth of Jesus. That is what he did while he was alive. That is the crucifixion. And that's when he was resurrected again. You will see the character in the being of Jesus and what he did in those four books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the beginning of the New Testament. My encouragement is that you will start off reading that as well. If you're like, I've already read that, here's another book. My son's going through this. I actually had to have him pump the brakes on it because 
Um, he's doing a great job, but he's doing a study on Proverbs on his own. Actually, his grandpa Gilbert was the one who encouraged him to do it, but I had to, I had to tell him to pump the brakes a little bit because he's like, Dad, do you want to do the, the study on Proverbs with me? I'm like, yeah, sure, let's go. Okay, so I read Proverbs 1. I'm like, hey, what what'd you get out of this on Proverbs 1? And he was like, well, uh, I'm already on Proverbs 12. I'm like, it's only been an hour. <laughs> like, what do you mean you're on Proverbs 12? He's like, yeah, and I have my notes. So I was looking at his notes, and I'm like, okay, no wrong in it. Okay, he was just looking at the scripture, writing the scripture down in his notebook. You cannot go wrong if you're reading then repeating it in your scripture. You're, you're just seeing it multiple times again. But I was breaking it down to him, like, son, when you study, read it, and then see what words keep popping up. There's going to be multiple words that keep popping up. What are they talking about? Look at the context. Break it down. Don't go 1 through 12. Just go through 1, maybe 1 through 5. Break everything up and study through it. Okay, okay. So I'm like, so we'll go back. Let's go through Proverbs 1 again, and then we'll, we'll talk about it and engage in this. And so I blame Grandpa Gilbert for not teaching him that and just making him read. I, um, I, have some, uh, I have some really good stories about Gilbert. We're talking about words of encouragement, so I'm, uh, I won't go over there because I think it's irrelevant from like, the words of encouragement, but I can't let those words bring me down. I have to continue to uh, build up. That'll be for a different sermon of gifts, of gifts and giving and generosity, those type of words. So I'll, I'll do that on another one. Um, but um, my family, I appreciate them so much. Um, they, they have built up my brother and I just with, with prayer and encouragement. And despite ups and downs in our lives that have taken place, they have always been consistent and constant with the gospel. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, church, I pray that you can apply these three points to your life. Of obedience, we have, to, we have to be obedient. Stop looking back. Stop looking back at your past. Stop looking back at maybe what's probably taking place now. If something's taking place now, take care of it. Engage with one another. Engage with people who you know you're going to trust. Stop venting to the wrong person. As you're obedient, obedient to the word of God, now start developing that prayer life. If you don't know how to pray, I gave you three scriptures that are prayers that you can start off with until you can build the courage by yourself. It's words. Think about it. Words of encouragement, words of affirmation through the word of God, how you can be better through Christ. Not how you can be better for you, but be better for Christ and then apply that to others. And then last, be authentic with that. Okay, be real about it. We see, we see what the definition says about it, but let's apply that to ourselves and then apply that to others. Uh, let's stand to our feet, church. I know in the past I tell like either really dark stories about myself or I tell really funny stories, but I felt just with our series that we have going on with words of, 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 of word up and words of encouragement and just everything... I see like there's, there's just so much going on like in our world. And that's, I just wanted to cover some content of especially the, the town of Sodom and, and Gomorrah because we see that that's happening now. Like as I read that, sometimes it's like foreign to us. Like you hear like, what? The Bible says stuff like perversion or like where those guys wanted to have relations with angels because they appeared appealing to them. Like we see that in our world now what's taking place like, there's something we could do about it, pray about it, stand up for what we believe in. Now, church, as we pray, um, just bow your head, close your eyes. And Father, thank you for bringing us here today. I pray that you can help us apply these three points to our life. Help us just be more and more obedient to you, Father, through your word and your prayer. Help us just be more disciplined, understanding your character and your being, Father. Help us apply your characteristics in our life. Help us apply those to others as we uh, work on our on our prayer, Father, and, and putting that into work, Lord. Help 
build us up, cleanse us of any uh, wrongdoings or sin that we have going on in our life, Lord. As we continue to persevere through our life, through, through your word and your love and your grace and mercy, I pray that you can help build us up and, and not look back on our sin or be reminded of our sin, Father. And as we apply this to our life, help us be authentic, authentic through, through your love, through your peace, through your self-righteous, so we could apply to us and then apply that to others, Lord. Thank you as we receive your word, Father. Help us as we go through the rest of this week and to share the gospel with someone else. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, thank you. I appreciate the time to share with you. Have a good week. Amen. And don't forget this Saturday. Amen. You better come in your tuxedo and your formal dress. And no, I'm just kidding. If you don't have one, that's fine. Come in a suit, though. Don't be coming in with your holy jeans, okay? <laughs> I'm not looking at anyone. <laughs> don't be coming in with those holy jeans, okay? This is going to be a nice time. You better wear a suit, man, with a tie. I was telling my dad, and he's, he's all, I don't, do I have to wear a tie? I was all, yes, dad. He goes, well, I don't know if I could tie it. I was all, I don't know that I could either, but we can have Eric do it, and then I'll just, we can put it on you. Amen. But uh, it's going to be a great time. So um, I don't know if there's anyone that did not get a chance to sign up. We might have a couple of openings so just see um, Michelle um, Kirshner back there if if you did not get to sign up and you really would like to go we're just going to have a good time there are some that I seen on our list that didn't sign up and I'm like oh my gosh I'm sad that they're not going to be there but that's all right we'll have a good time and then the next morning Sunday just because we're out late Friday uh, Saturday night come on you you remember you used to stay out late and get up early amen you better be at church because we have Dr. Jerry Savelle amen and we have a great morning planned with a lot of good things so I'm encouraging you to be here Sunday morning amen, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, are you ready to give? Yeah. Amen. Are you ready to talk? Are you ready? <laughs> or are you just saying you're ready? We need you to be ready. Ready, ready. Good. Thank you, Candy. You're ready. Somebody back here is ready. Oh, back there is ready. Praise the Lord. Bobby. Bobby's always ready. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to read out of 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4. Um, and right above my uh, beginning, before verse 1, it says, The widows, widow's olive oil. Amen. How many of you like stories about these wonderful women, even though they didn't have a name? I kind of taught on that um, this past weekend, that there are women in the Bible that we could glean from, and they don't even have a name. You know, there's not a name attached to them other than the widow's uh, oil other than the Shunammite woman under the uh, how about the woman with the issue of blood but all these women were uh, warriors at, in what they did I mean the the woman with the issue of blood she heard about Jesus she said if I just touch all I need to do is touch he doesn't even have to lay a hand on me all I need to do is touch the hem of his garment amen Amen, and I know I'll be made whole, right? For how many years did she suffer? How? Huh? Twelve? Twelve years. Can you imagine? Twelve years, and then she heard about Jesus. Amen, and so what did she say? Because we're learning about words. She said, man, all I need to do is touch. All I need to do is just grab. It doesn't have to be the arm. It doesn't have it's just the hem the hem, the, just the very little hem of his garment, and I'm going to be made whole. So there's a lot of great women that we, we don't know their name, but God speaks about them in the Bible. Amen? So this woman starts out, it says, the wife of a man 
from the company of the prophets called out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know, you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. So tell that, tell me that she's not in a predicament here. Uh, she's in, a, in, a, in trouble. She, she's having some trouble, right? She's having some issues like every single one of us could have this morning. You might be facing something. You might have an issue. You might have a, a predicament. You might have some trouble somewhere down the line or even today. Well, this woman, it looked like she was having some difficulties, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're threatening her, right? Yeah, come on. They're threatening. They're they're sending letters. They're they're going through the certified letter. You know, come on. You, you we know you got this because we have the return right here. Come on. They're they're doing everything they can because they're they're trying to get whatever's owed to them, right? And so um, she goes to the man of God. Amen. She goes to this person that she knew her husband was connected with. She goes there and she, she tells him, this is what's happening. I know that you're going to help me. I just know uh, that's why I'm coming to you because whenever we're in trouble, the Bible says, where should we go? Wow. Oh, nobody knows to the Lord, right? Pastor Juan always said, don't ever run from God run to God. When we are in trouble, man, we need to run to God. Amen. And so she went to the man of God and he said, how can I help you? Tell me, um, what do you have in your house? And the servant said, nothing at all, except for just a small jar of oil. And Elisha said, uh, go around, ask all your neighbors, get all the empty jars. Don't just ask for one or two or three, but ask for a lot. Amen. Because if you're in a crisis, you need to go to God. You need to be think big because we serve a big God. Amen. He said, don't just go get one in two jars. No, ask for a lot. Go searching and find a lot. Amen. And um, so she did. She asked everyone and she got all the jars. She sa it says that she went inside, shut the door. And, she, and he said, you and your sons pour the oil into all the jars. Fill every one of them every single one of them, put him to his side and see what happens. So she left him, shut the door, her and her sons, they brought the jars. She, she kept pouring and pouring till all the jars were full. And she said to her son, bring me another. And he says, there's not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. And she went and told the man and he said, now go sell it, go sell the oil, pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. Amen. What a great story. Amen. Amen. Whenever you're in trouble, go to God. Amen. Whenever you think you don't have anything, God always provides. Amen. There's always something that you can give to God. Don't ever think that you can come to church and you don't have anything. Yes, you do. You always have something. Amen. There's always something. And when we allow God to move in our lives and when we allow him to speak into our lives and when we obey him, because she had to obey, she could have said, well, that sounds silly. I don't think I can do that. I'm only going to get one jar. Come on. We, how many of us do that? Amen. She could have done that, but she didn't. She listened to the prophet. She listened to the man of God. She went and did exactly as he said. And everything went well. Amen. Amen. So if you want God to be a blessing in your life and to help you through every season, then we have to obey. I always say that you have to obey. You have to listen and be obedient. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ushers, if you would. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Stretch your hands out. Father, we just praise you and we thank you for another opportunity to honor you with the first fruits of all of our income, to say thank you for the things that you have done in our lives, 
to honor you because you are the most important person in our life, Jesus. And we want to be obedient and we want to follow you with every fiber of our being. We want to love you with all of our hearts and all of our mind and all of our souls. Jesus, we want to be obedient to the things that you have taught us throughout these years. We don't want to just do it half-heartedly. We want to do it with all of our heart. Father, and so we thank you, and I thank you for every person that has sown seed throughout these years, God. Continue to bless them. Continue to open the windows of heaven. Continue to meet every need, Father, according to your riches and glory. So we give you honor, and we give you praise, and we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.